Hello. As part of your portfolio defense, you'll prepare and deliver a 10 to 15 minute presentation as outlined in the OPAL portfolio defense guidelines. During preparation for my defense, I reflected on my two and a half years in the program and found there were so many important takeaways. One important one was in the area of virtual teams, so I decided to make this the focus of my presentation. The following is my defense presentation, including some reflections and tips based on my team experiences in the OPAL program that hopefully you'll find helpful. The OPAL program has provided rich opportunities to apply what I've learned in projects, receive guidance from faculty, and build on the models and methods of giants. As a result, I've emerged as a much stronger practitioner with more than just some training or HPT tools in my toolbox. I've really come to learn that an important part of the OPAL program and human performance improvement process in general is teamwork. In most cases, we just can't go it alone. One very important part of my OPAL journey has been the opportunity to sharpen my teamwork tools and more specifically, teamwork in virtual teams. My background in the aviation industry requires that I work in a team environment every day. This includes working with many to move an aircraft safely from point A to point B. Just like our aircraft in formation flight, this teamwork is through a well-choreographed dance of people, equipment, procedures, decision-making, and standardized communications. However, I encountered a very different type of team in the OPAL program, the virtual team. Though this team participates in many of the same types of processes as in-person teams and still has a goal of mission success, it can be altogether very different. My first virtual team experience in the OPAL program was anything but this well-choreographed dance of formation flight. Instead, it was a real wake-up call that in order to get a project smoothly and successfully from point A to point B, I needed to acquire and use some very different tools to succeed. In fact, virtual teams are so important to successful outcomes that they're represented as OPAL Learning Goals 7, 8, and 10. These goals emphasize the importance of team processes that include collaboration, effective communication, whether it's written, verbal, or visual, and contributing to a community of practice. As each semester passed and I participated in more virtual teams, I sharpened my teamwork skills and tools and slowly got better. However, that's not to say that I didn't encounter some turbulence and bumps, bumps along the way. Though nerve-wracking and frustrating at times, even the worst of my virtual team experiences actually provided the best experiences from which to learn how to be better. So what's the difference between the smooth team project where everyone encountered clear skies and those that encountered turbulence? I believe the key lies in the reflection on my virtual team experiences. Dubay and Roby on page 9 of their 2008 article in the Information Systems Journal is titled Surviving the Paradoxes of Virtual Teamwork, and they introduce five paradoxes that represent contradictions in virtual teamwork and the strategies that team members can use to overcome or survive them. I'd like to use these five paradoxes as a way to highlight some of the things that went right and wrong in my OPAL virtual team experiences and some lessons that I learned along the way. The first of Dubay and Roby's five paradoxes is virtual teams require physical presence. OPAL students often live miles apart and we can't always get together in person. We often use technology to bridge that gap. So in order to inject physical presence, we held weekly standing meetings to maintain a rhythm and we used video conferencing software so we could see each other in person. We also prioritized the meetings in our schedule and really made time to attend because we were committed to the project. We also tried to limit distractions, whether they were physical, mental, or technological, so that we were really present. And we allowed a little time for small talk to build relationships and shared personal experiences. In the most successful and enjoyable teams that I participated in, we really got to know each other on a more personal level and discussed our struggles at home or work or in class. Without this, we were just nameless team members kind of knocking out a project. And when we enjoyed working with each other and contributing to a meaningful project, we were really present and engaged in meetings and discussions. But when some of these elements didn't exist, it was a turbulent ride, and we as a team experienced weak deliverables, poor scores, and less value delivered to the client. 
The second paradox is flexibility of virtual teams is aided by structure. Successful teams used quite a bit of structure so that we could get ahead and stay ahead, but still remain flexible when last minute things arose or we ran into trouble. We did this by creating and actually following a team charter, which outlined roles and communication procedures and established group norms. And we weren't afraid to update it when it was necessary. We also used a teammate as a lookout or a point person and who, what, when chart to keep ahead on due dates and task requirements. This kept us focused. We also assigned roles and task requirements so that all team members had something they were responsible for and all tasks were covered. In the most successful teams, we often made these assignments based on the strengths or the weaknesses of team members. And structure was also used to chunk bigger assignments into smaller parts so that teams could be more effective. We also built in buffers to allow for flexibility to ensure that last minute things that popped up wouldn't ruin our success. The more unsuccessful teams that I participate in often moved way too far to the flexible end of the spectrum where deliverables were created in marathon sessions. And in one case, one of these marathons lasted six hours. And we made a place for feedback in the successful teams and an iterative process. We could be flexible enough to get deliverables ready, but at the same time give areas that needed extra focus a little extra time. Weak teams didn't build this flexibility into the process, and so we often created documents on the fly. We found ourselves in the get it done, get it done mode, and this didn't allow enough time for review. The third paradox is interdependent work in virtual teams is accomplished by members' independent contributions. Successful teams leveraged independent contributions as part of a collective whole and experienced smooth flight. And we did this by building a collaborative environment where conflict was low and we all felt comfortable to share information and drafts and ideas and we made decisions together. We also used technology to support collaboration and communication, and we turned individual contributions into collective deliverables. We also built a culture of trust through personal relationships and managing conflict. So again, we all felt comfortable in bringing our ideas forward. There wasn't a lot of time or energy lost in second guessing team members. And all of these independent contributions were submitted by a strong leader or an agent of connection. But in order to build on each other's ideas and contributions, you actually have to have individual members making contributions. So it was important to encourage engagement in the successful teams to make sure that everybody had responsibilities. We could come together, bring those individual contributions and build on them as well as the knowledge and abilities of others and ultimately improve the quality of the outcomes. The fourth of the paradoxes is task-oriented virtual teamwork succeeds through social interactions. Social interactions are important, but they take work. And in a virtual team, they don't just happen because there's lack of, of close proximity for teammates. So the chances of you bumping into, the hall, into your teammates in the hallway or seeing each other at lunch is probably pretty low. So virtual teams really have to purposely seek out those interactions. In some of the most successful teams, we really put a priority on social interactions and relationships with team members. And we held meetings to build on the idea that the collection of all of us is better than one of us. Though skipping meetings because they were perceived to not be necessary seemed like a good idea, in the most successful teams, we usually went ahead and met anyway because we knew that the best pieces of information, ideas, or knowledge sharing often occurred when nothing was really going on. And in the successful teams, we also understood there was a social component of learning and knowledge sharing. Weaker teams often made the mistake that strong independent team members would result in a strong collective whole, and this just wasn't always the case. In successful teams, we also tried to avoid overly focusing on deliverables and project outcomes. We tried not to lose sight that we could learn from each other. And those social interactions and these social interactions also help to refuel individual team members when there was a dip in energy or motiva motivation. Often weaker teams left team members to suffer in silence. The final of the paradoxes is mistrust is 
instrumental to establishing trust among virtual team members. Virtual teams often start out with a little mistrust because you can't see someone working on a project or you can't pick up on those nonverbal communication cues to size up other members. So successful teams use methods early on to turn this around and establish trust. Some describe trust as the glue that holds the team together. And so successful teams create glue at the beginning by using control mechanisms in the team charter to build trust amongst each other. This may include communication escalation techniques and conflict mitigation strategies. In the successful teams, we also try to give team members the benefit of the doubt going in and assume that everyone was committed to the project, we want it to produce high quality deliverables, engage in a learning experience, and we want it to provide value to the client. We also use task delegation and due dates and timelines to help team members act reliably and trustworthy, and we build on that concept that actions speak louder than words. But all of this hinged on accountability and honesty of individual team members. In the successful teams, we really relied on each other to speak up when we needed help or support. In some of the more unsuccessful teams, team members often didn't own up to being behind or not understanding, and so this resulted in a need to create deliverables last minute. Not only did this, rely, not only did this result in poor scores, but it really weakened trust amongst team members, and there was a lot of wasted time spent redoing or micromanaging or duplicating efforts. So these paradoxes help us to see that some of the most important elements that are necessary to being part of a successful virtual team. In some of the weaker teams that I participated in, we didn't always survive these paradoxes. And we not only experienced negative happenings in the team, but it really diffused into other areas, including anxiety and increased workload and risks to the project and even potential harm or less value delivered to the client or the organization. So using the OPAL learning goals as a framework, we can really see that when there's a breakdown in virtual teams, it can really affect the bigger picture. This may result in a breakdown in systematic thinking, which results in things being missed or overlooked. It may result in limited systemic thinking or behaviors that are inconsistent with professional standards. It may also cause some rushing that may lead to unethical behavior just to get it done. And we may overlook using important tools or not consider all the angles as part of a systemic process or not allow enough time for a true iterative process, really reducing the ability of outcomes to align with strategic goals. It may also lead to less than valuable recommendations, and we may not have those critical conversations that really push back on data sources, methods, or tool use, or their effects, and this puts holes in evidence-based practice. It may result in poor written, or verbal, or visual communications with each other, stakeholders, or the client. And we wouldn't be supporting the valuable community of practice where social sharing of information and knowledge is vital to learning and practice. So working in a virtual team can be complex at times, but it is truly a valuable skill. Through my experiences of virtual teams in the OPAL program, I've added a valuable tool to my toolbox. Without it, HPT processes can be much more difficult and restrictive, leading to less effective communications, deliverables, recommendations, and really reduce the true impact and value that we can provide. Truly, some of us is not as effective as all of us in getting a project smoothly and successfully from point A to point B. In order to fly smoothly, virtual teams must balance presence, structure along with a little flexibility, independent work joined together into a collective whole, social interactions, and trust. So this concludes my presentation, and I hope that you find some of these reflections and ideas helpful in your own OPAL virtual team experiences.